Hi, and welcome back to the last section of the Social Learning Strategies Lecture. So we're going to be considering a different category of social learning strategies now, and that is content dependent cultural transmission biases. Uh, some of which feature in a body of theory within cultural evolution called cultural attraction. We'll then also summarize the lecture and draw a few conclusions. So content dependent social learning strategies are considered direct biases as individuals copy another according to the content of the behavioral trait that they exhibit, rather than according to contextual factors like the individual's characteristics, which would be a model based bias. Now, there are many studies of uh, biases for social information, uh, so, um, biases for social information, sorry, uh, survival information, and for things that prompt emotional reactions like disgust. But these tend to be in humans and have implications for the transmission of narratives like fairy tales, fake news, urban legends, and conspiracy theories. Now, if you're interested in this area of uh, cultural evolution research, then please do look at another online module in this lecture series by Joe Stubbersfield and Jamie Tarani. And it's called The Never Ending Story, Cultural Evolution and Narratives. So getting back to social learning strategies in animals, however, there have been several studies highlighting evidence for a direct payoff bias in social learning. So here individuals make an assessment of the value of a behavioral trait um, that an individual is displaying using the apparent payoffs of this behavior to the demonstrator or the model. The first such payoff bias social learning strategy to consider is a bias to copy the highest payoff behavior. <coughs> in this study uh, that I'm going to talk about now, the behavior is related to different ways of extracting the fatty protein rich seeds in a Panama fruit, which has a hardened outer shell and also has nasty stinging hairs on the outside. Now this Panama fruit is entirely novel to the wild white faced capuchin populations that the researchers Brendan Barrett and Susan Perry uh, were studying. So they introduced this uh, Panama fruit to these groups and they were able to observe the rise and spread of novel extractive foraging traditions. So their monkeys uh, displayed seven different techniques for dealing with these novel fruits um, and they differed in efficiency, the speed of acquiring the seeds and efficacy, the likelihood of success and costs such as harm from the stinging hairs. In this photo here, you can see the highest payoff behavior, which was the use of the canines to bite uh, quite specifically on the seam of the fruit to split it open. Now this figure shows the relationship for individuals between how often they observe the high payoff behavior being demonstrated in the population and the probability that they themselves use this high payoff behavior. And you can see that all individuals showed a preference for the highest payoff option. If you compare the curve to the dashed unbiased social learning line, it highlights their tendency to perform the high payoff behavior at a higher rate than they had observed it, observed it much like the S-shaped uh, conformity curve I talked about in the previous lecture segment. However, you can also see at the top here that at higher rates, um, uh, of um, observing this high payoff behavior, um, individuals showed a weak anti-conformity bias. So in other words, when they had a very high rate of observation of the high payoff option, they became less likely to use uh, that behavior and demonstrate a preference for the rarer low payoff option instead. We also have evidence for use of this payoff bias in another study of wild vervet monkeys, uh, where the dominant male and female of each group are trained to open a puzzle box to retrieve food. So to understand this study, you first have to know that the researchers had already established that when payoffs are equal, so here the female gains one apple piece when she opens the white door of the box, and the male gains one apple piece when he opens the black door of the box. Uh, so when this is the case, there is a bias for everyone, male or female, as indicated on the, on the figure here, um, to copy the dominant female in the group represented in pink, rather than the dominant male in the group. 
And this is presumed to be due to the fact that in vervet monkeys, it is the male who disperses. And so females are the philopatric sex and can be assumed by their group members to have superior ecological information as they've grown up in that ecology uh, than the immigrant dominant male. So this is a context dependent model based bias. Now, when the study is repeated, but with unequal payoffs, you get a different result. So now the female opens the white side of the box to retrieve only one apple piece, and the male opens the black side of the box to retrieve five apple pieces. So in this context, when the female's payoff is lower than the male's, male observers, but not female observers, as you can see on this figure, you see the males here have switched to copying the male whereas the females have not. And the researchers explain the sex difference in observers' use of payoff by social learning as due to the fact that resident females can afford to be more conservative in their foraging preferences, whereas the dispersing sex, in this case the males, may have to be more behaviorally flexible in order to survive. <coughs> so this study nicely highlights a point I was making earlier, that multiple biases can be present simultaneously, but also the point I made at the beginning of the lecture, that these social learning strategies are not hard and fast rules, and they can be used quite flexibly. Now, obviously, a direct payoff bias is much more accurate than, say, a bias for copying individuals you assume are likely to display beneficial behaviour. So another class of payoff bias that could be important for cumulative culture is a copy of better strategy. And this is because if you can assess the payoff of your own behavior and compare it to the payoff of another's behavior, then you're able to change your established behavior to the observed one um, if it's more valuable than your own. So this strategy would ensure beneficial modifications to existing traits for example, a desktop computer, uh, spread enabling the cumulative evolution of a trait. For example, the transition of a desktop computer to the iPad. In other words, this cognitively, uh, relatively cognitively complex social learning strategy may enable a population to converge on a, a fitness maximizing behavior over repeated learning events or repeated generations. <coughs> Now, despite its complexity, a copy of better social learning strategy has been seen in species other than humans. So one of the earliest studies of this strategy was in stickleback fish using the setup that you're now familiar with. So Jeremy Kendall uh, in this study showed that observer fish who had an established preference for a foraging patch were actually able to change that preference if following a demonstration of foraging by other fish they perceive that the foraging patch preferred by others is better than their own. Now, there have also been similar studies in chimpanzees by Jill Vale et al. and Edwin Van Leeuwen et al. In this diagram, you can see the study I conducted with Jill Vale, where chimpanzees acquired personal information that, for example, exchanging the yellow token here at the exchange window earned them um, a small reward, a piece of carrot. Um, whereas uh, they could observe other individuals exchanging the black token here at the window for a larger reward, so five pieces of apple. And the question was whether they would be more likely to swap which token they exchanged in this context than if they observed that the black token was exchanged for an equivalent or lesser reward than the personally learnt yellow token. So these studies have actually highlighted that although influenced by the higher payoff behaviour of others, chimpanzees are rather conservative and they tend to stick to their known behaviour, copying others only if they are dissatisfied. So at the moment, it doesn't appear from these studies, at least, that chimpanzees accurately compare their behavioural payoff to that of another, but instead rely more on an assessment of whether the payoff of their own behaviour is good or not. Now, more research is actually needed in this area, but use of this copy of better strategy may partly explain the relative lack of cumulative culture that we see in chimpanzees. So to conclude this lecture on social learning strategies, let's consider a little more what the role of so social learning strategies or transmission biases might be in culture. 
So as you will have already realized from the many examples in this lecture, social learning strategies can be implicated in the maintenance of adaptive behavior in populations. For example, what to eat or how to eat it. Um, you can also think back to the various examples of what animals socially learn outside the foraging domain from earlier lectures and subsequent lectures on different animal taxa. Likewise, we've also discussed how social learning strategies are involved in the establishment of traditions or, and or culture in animals. For example, different traditions for extractive foraging of resources in neighboring communities, as in the Thai forest chimpanzees example. Now, further evidence for the role of different types of social learning strategies comes from modeling work by Luc Rendel et al. As you can see in this figure, they simulated how different learning strategies play out in terms of increasing the frequency of a trait, as you can see on the y-axis here. And this is at the population level over time, as indicated by cultural generations on the x-axis here. And as you can see, direct bias or content bias leads to the most rapid establishment of a, a, a beneficial behavioral trait in a population. This is followed by frequency dependent bias in red here. Um, whereas unbiased transmission where individuals copy others completely at random is not helpful at all for establishing beneficial cultural traits as you can see by the black line here. But we should keep in mind, however, that direct payoff type biases and to an extent frequency dependent biases are actually much harder to implement than they um, than are the relatively quick and dirty um, biases that influence individuals to copy others according to their characteristics, for example, copy adults or copy dominant individuals. Those types of indirect biases are much easier to just quickly use than biases which require you to assess the payoff of another individual's behavior um, and do that for several individuals in the population before you make a decision who to copy. A nice illustration of the differing utility of social learning strategies dependent upon context and the difficulty of implementing them is given by considering that the role of social learning strategies in culture is dependent on um, the phase of a behavior's establishment in a population. <clears throat> so in the transmission phase, uh, which uh, immediately follows the initial discovery of an innovation by an individual in the population, you might expect direct or content biased social learning strategies to be occurring, as there would be lots of diversity and proficiency of models in using this new innovation. So you really have to pay attention to whether the behavioral trait being exhibited by an individual is a good one and whether it has a high payoff, for example. Now, in the tradition phase, uh, when the once novel behavior is established and common in the population, it may no longer be necessary to use the more difficult to implement direct payoff bias. At this point, indirect or context dependent social learning strategies may bias naive individuals towards copying of individuals who are just generally successful at survival in the assumption that they're likely therefore good at the behavior in question. So here you may get model based biases such as copy adults or dominant individuals or frequency dependent biases such as conformity. Now just this effect was observed by Camilla Coelho et al when observing the spread of a novel nut cracking behavior in a group of semi wild capuchin monkeys in Brazil. So in this figure here, you can see the frequency of nut cracking behavior in different age groups over a 10 year period. And you can see that in the early transmission phase, uh, 1997 to 1999, juvenile monkeys were the main practitioners of nutcracking. However, 10 years later, coming up to 2007, as these juveniles have matured to adulthood, nutcracking is practiced uh, far more often by adults in the group than juveniles or infants. And accordingly, uh, the authors of this paper reported that early on, individuals chose whom to observe based on direct or content cues of proficiency. And this was thought possibly due to the high variability in quality of available models. However, during the tradition phase, when the behavior had become established some 10 years later, individuals could use um, much uh, easier rules of thumb or heuristics such as 
copy the generally successful dominant male or older, more experienced individuals. And actually they, they did find that age at least uh, did correlate with nutcracking proficiency. So this uh, copy older individuals would be a sensible strategy. Now, due to the difficulty of observing the inception of traditions and following them over a long period, examples like this one are quite rare. However, you may well see more in the studies presented by lectures which follow this one on culture and different animal taxa. <coughs> so we've covered an awful lot of ground in this lecture. So I just want to now give you a summary of the key take home messages regarding social learning strategies and transmission biases in animal culture. <coughs> so um, information sources, whether they're personal or social, are used selectively, but not necessarily consciously, according to social learning strategy theory. And in animals, it appears that personal information is acquired or used preferentially, unless it's somehow costly to do so. And this describes state based biases. Now, the use of social information may be influenced by a variety of biases or social learning strategies. So it may be influenced by a copy of the majority type social learning strategy uh, described as a frequency dependent social learning strategy. Now, remember, however, the alternative use of the term conformity, which is more related to peer pressure. Social learning may also be influenced by the identity of the information source. So model based bias social learning strategies such as copy dominance, males or females, prestigious individuals or older individuals. And um, the propensity to socially learn may also be influenced by the content of the information or behavioral trait. So this describes direct biases such as an assessment of the payoff of a displayed behavior. And finally, social information may be acquired through random copying. And this uh, describes unbiased social learning strategies. And as I've hinted throughout the lecture, social learning strategies are not hard and fast rules, but are used flexibly, dependent on uh, context or life stage, and often in combination to shape behavior. And as we've just seen, different social learning strategies are influential at different phases of tradition formation. And this may be influenced by the difficulty of applying different types of social learning strategies. <coughs> and finally, social learning strategies or cultural transmission biases can influence cultural patterns. So they're implicated in the establishment of cultural traditions and cultural diversity, and they're implicated in the apparent taxonomic spread of cumulative cultural evolution. So I encourage you to view the subsequent lectures to learn more about social learning in different uh, animal taxa, as well as cumulative culture and the implications of animal studies for understanding evolutionary biology, the evolution of human culture and the conservation of animals. So I leave you now uh, with a color coded cheat sheet to help you with any confusion over the terminology in this field, especially if you decide to read further and there are further, further readings indicated for this lecture on the website. So Boyd and Richardson proposed biases for cultural transmission back in 1985. And since then, Henrik and McElrith have used alternative terms, as has uh, Kevin Leyland, who translated the terms into social learning strategies in 2004. So I've highlighted each of these uh, different key authors in different colors. And here you can see how each of these terms used by these authors correspond to each other. Um, so I should just leave you with that cheat sheet in case it's useful for you. Um, and that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and wish you well with your studies or your research.